You deserve way more subs. These reviews are well written and edited. Can you do Total Drama Redonkulous Race? It's the nostalgic Pokemon music and genuine facts for me. Love these videos. We gotta get some more Total Drama content from you soon. Please make more Total Drama reviews. I love to hear you talk about World Tour or Revenge of the Island. The amount of quality for one can and a half is insane. I think I might have found a new favorite. Love yourself, man. You're heavily underrated. Keep up I the like good the work. I like the part where you trashed Pocketail Island. Love your videos. Hope you really make been more enjoying the new future. content. Can we Keep get a out. video on your thoughts like on the, the original video cast? Scam across your channel. For more yes, content, it's pretty simple. Thanks for your I love you. Keep it down. Give us race total drama. Great. My favorite season. Dude, I watched it for Pocketail. I recognize that picture. The animated Pokemon, Mario, and the Super Mario story. I'm the Super Mario story. I love your voice. OMG, bro, you 17. You got a voice like a 25 year old. Oh, fine, I'll make another video. What's up guys, Flux here, blah blah blah, gap between uploads, blah blah blah, this script took a really long time to write, blah blah blah, thank you for this amount of views and subscribers, it's probably grown a hell of a lot since I took the screenshot, really guys, it means a lot, this whole skate was kind of a joke, but I really do appreciate these numbers, like holy, 3.5k, god damn, that's a lot of subscribers, and if it's for family, let's go. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, Evis for Family is an adult Netflix original similar to the likes of Bojack Horseman, get used to hearing that name in these videos, Paradise PD, and Hoops. But only in terms of animation and voice acting because that's where the Hoops comparison stopped because this show sucks, get it off the screen. I only bring up those shows to say that compared to Hoops, Bojack, and other adult shows on Netflix, I feel like the coverage for Evis for Family is pretty light. There's tons of videos for these shows talking about how good, bad, or even disappointing they are, but Evis for Family doesn't really have much to his name in terms of negative or positive criticism. And it's not like the show doesn't have an audience. The trailer for the third season got a million views on YouTube, and the series ended on a pretty high note with its fifth season in November. So what's the catch? Is the show like Bojack, weaving expertly crafted stories with incredible emotion-heavy moments? Or is it more like Hoops in Paradise PD, trading witty jokes for poor writing and juvenile humor? It's hard to explain, but Evis for Family strikes somewhere in the middle for me. It's not overly vulgar to the point of disgust like these shows are, but it's nowhere near as star-studded as these Netflix original series are either. Would I recommend it? Mm, yeah, maybe. And since it's pretty good, I wanted to give the show some love by reviewing every season of it from start to finish, giving you all a taste of the show I rather enjoy. Aside from the first episode, I'll try to make my episode synopses as quick as detailed as I can for time purposes, so if you enjoy my commentary, then definitely check out the show on Netflix. There's a lot of jokes and subtle details I can't do justice in this retrospective, so be sure to explore more for yourself. Oh, and uh, spoiler warning for the entire show, basically. And with all that out the way, it's time we start our deep dive into the 44 episodes of Chaos that is Evis for Family. Let's get started. The first season of Ephesus for Family is definitely the weakest, which is why I'm grateful they get their story across in 6 episodes as opposed to the 10 episodes they transition to from season 2 onwards. That's not to say the first season isn't good in its own way, but it suffers from several awkward new show first starting moments that luckily get corrected in later seasons. This leaves us with a batch of episodes that are raw in their presentation but still leave room for blossoming into broader, better ideas. The show was created by comedian Bill Burr, whose stand-up I was unfamiliar with prior to making this video. Stephen Hawkins, yeah! Too good to fucking stand up and make his point just sitting down all fucking sleep. And after watching a couple of his specials, which are also on Netflix if you want to check him out, you can easily tell how his odd comedic styles influenced the jokes that would come to be on the show. The Netflix original was pitched as, and I quote, a show that would take place in the 70s, a time where you could smack your kid, smoke inside, and bring a gun to the airport. Which for 2022 standards probably would have gotten the show cancelled before sketch pencils could even hit the paper. And they're not wrong, the first season is chocked full of ignorant racism and stereotypes that are occasionally funny but sometimes can feel like overkill. One of the showrunners helped write The Simpsons prior to this, so some of that style of humor bleeds into the sitcom, the first season especially. But regardless, we gotta get through the rougher side of the series before we can talk about its gems. With that being said, let's discuss these six episodes in detail, starting with... The show starts off with Frank Murphy, the working class ex-veteran father, driving home to have dinner with the rest of the main cast. There's Sue Murphy, the hardworking housewife, Kevin, the misunderstood elder child, Bill, the indecisive middle child, Maureen, the spoiled newest child, and their dog Major. Don't worry about him too much though, since he doesn't really end up doing too much for the rest of the show. And I'm describing these characters at their base for now, but we'll get into how the show opens up their character as time passes on. Anyway, after some quick dialogue from each of the main characters to Frank, giving us some of that sweet character exposition, the telephone starts ringing. Jesus Christ. I'm not answering that. Frank, you should answer it. What if somebody got hurt? Nobody ever gets hurt at supper, Susan, okay? It's always some goddamn salesman, and I'm not answering it. 
Dad, we all know you're gonna answer it. You don't know a goddamn thing about me. If you think that was unprovoked rage or bad parenting, then trust me, you're not ready for the rest of this review. After letting the phone ring for quite some time, Frank finally gets up to go answer the phone. The caller turns out to be someone selling en engraved Bibles, which angers Frank to the point of screaming, something that none of the other family members even seem to acknowledge is happening right in front of them. After storming out of the room and yelling at one of the neighborhood kids, Get the fuck out! We treated to the intro of the show, which does an amazing job of showcasing the main premise of the series. Set to the tone of Come and Get Your Love by Redbone, it shows Frank as a teenager after high school, flying through the air without a care in the world only to get drafted, become a father, and eventually turning to the blind, fat, balding man he would be today. It's a great way of establishing Frank's character with scenery and gives us a bit of early insight as to why he's so goddamn angry. We cut back to the family watching Colt Luger, a TV show parodying 70s action flicks. It's hammy, overtly sexist, and shamefully racist, but god, it can be funny sometimes. See? You see that? That right there, that is a man. That is a stunt man. What was that? Nothing. That's enough, Kevin. Your father already had his dinner ruined. Don't you ruin his favorite show. It's one of his few joys in life. Wild thing to say to one of your own children, but okay. You'll quickly notice that Frank places his own interests above his own children a lot, and it usually comes back later to bite him in the ass. Anyway, Frank sees a commercial for a boxing match on TV and insists that he and Sue throw a watch party to, you know, Watch it. He goes on a long tirade about how he needs the big chair in front of the TV, some nice bottle of beer, demonetizable content that I can't show if I want to get ads on this video, the whole nine yards. After getting dismissed, the kids go outside and do stuff so they can get in on that sweet character development too. The younger duo go to hang out with Ben and Kenny, two names I didn't know before I started writing the script of this video. They're essentially comic relief, just some neighborhood kids with really messed up family that we never get to see. And Kevin goes to uh... Hey, can you stay away from that loose girl down on River Street? I don't want any half-slut grandkids. We're not doing anything! Neither was I! That's how you got here! Yeah, Kevin's doing stuff too. Let's get back to the other kids. Bill's putting Magnus on stuff for a school project, remember that for later. And after some weird hijinks that includes this line... Tastes like mama's gone. Bill's magnet ends up on the front door of their neighbor's house, leading to one of my favorite running jokes in the first season. Kids all say, he's Hitler's little brother. Yeah, yeah, and he hunts down kids. Shut up, he's gonna hear you. <gasps> Hello! Uh, do you need some help? Yeah, that's right. Somehow the kids mix up German and Jewish and are terrified of a frail Holocaust survivor. It sounds terrible, and it is, but the misdirection here is hilarious. It's especially funny because the lines they add seconds later. You see that number on his arm? That's how many people he's killed! It's a scoreboard! Despite being overly vulgar at times like its contemporaries, the show does nail dark humor when it tries. We cut back to Frank discussing his family plans with his neighbors, but conflict arises when the two reveal that they've already been invited by their other neighbor, Vic Reynolds. Ooh, Frank doesn't like that one bit. As he goes on another long-winded rant, the man in question finally shows up. Hola, amigos! Just the men I want to see! <laughs> yeah, I love this man. He's the perfect foil to Frank in every way. Frank's working hard in an airport, while Vic works a radio station where he basically just gets paid to show up. Frank's got three kids, a wife and a dog, while Vic juggles girls around as he pleases. Frank's balding and having a midlife crisis. Vic's in his 20s, and as we just saw there, is the definition of a ladies' man. And the best part is, despite everything I just told you, Vic is actually one of the nicest characters on the show. Like the entire season, I was expecting him to down talk Frank or intentionally flex his success on him, but he actually still looks up to Frank and respects what he does for his family. Vic offers an invitation to watch the fight at his house with his very impressive 32 inch color TV. 32 inches? <laughs> That's pretty big. Up here, babe. But Frank turns it down because, get this, he's already asked to host the party on his 33 inch TV. Do you see where I'm going with this? It's a pretty basic plot for a show like this, but since it's the first episode of the first season, I guess I'm gonna have to let it slide! The kids are back to doing what kids do, rolling down a hill in a barrel, obviously. Clearly I missed that part of my development. They roll a bit too far and end up hitting a little clubhouse that houses another character that I'm quite fond of, Jimmy Fitzsimmons. If you couldn't tell from his greaser fit, he's a bully. That's his character. Moving on. Get back here, Murphy, and let me fucking kill you! Sue and Frank contemplate whether or not they really want this TV, and it's here that we start to dip more into their questionable dynamic as husband and wife. All I'm saying is you don't get to make big financial decisions like this by yourself. Then agree with me. That way we both decided together. This is just a spoonful of the Frank does not and will not listen portion of the show, which there is a lot of. Despite trying to stick to their budget, the two walk in and immediately get overwhelmed by all the flashing colored TVs in a scene that's pretty well animated. After getting violently finessed, they pull some strings and buy the biggest TV in the entire store. Now that's how you portion your budget. We get back to... 
Come on, just touch it a little. No. I won't tell anybody. No. Then let me touch you. No. Come on, you're so pretty and you're so cool and I really like you and you're the only one I want to touch it. We here at Fuck Skies Entertainment do not condone this level of desperation. If she says no the first time, then leave it at that. By the third time you ask, you're already too deep to deny accountability. Maureen tells Kevin that Bill is about to get killed by some big kids, which, yeah, why the hell is this one kid throwing lit sticks of dynamite? Kevin speeds over to help Bill out and let Jimmy know that. See? Now you stepping out of your lane once again, so I'm gonna have to smack that ass. I think now would be a good time to bring up the art style and animation of this show. The art style is passable, I mean in an era where adult cartoons would look anywhere between this and this or even this atrocity, it's not the worst thing in the world to look at. The more I watched the show, the more the designs got a little bit easier on the eyes, but the animation can feel pretty clunky at times, especially in the first season. I don't know how this choppy as hell looking scene made it to the final version, but hey, what are you gonna do? Kevin saves Bill, then proceeds to punch him in the stomach, which is something I can relate to as an older brother. Back at home, Frank finally gets to enjoy the TV he spent six 640 70 errors dollars on which is about 3k for future inflation times i hope it was worth kevin's college fund that he spent on it it's kevin's college fund come on so we both know kevin's not going to college in the morning bill continues with his madden homework when he sees the tv i wonder how this is gonna affect the story <laughs> What a twist! Frank argues with Sue about the TV, prompting this joke, which still makes me giggle a little. But did you pour water down it? No, I didn't pour water down it! Don't yell at me! No, you're undermining me no, already! I'm not. The hell you're not! I'm not. Why the fuck would I Our pour TV's water broken. down what it? What is it? You're on the side of the TV! But surprisingly, Frank doesn't suspect that the kids did it and instead thinks that the store clerk sold him a bad TV. After dragging the TV back to his car, with Vic still not phased in the slightest, he finally gets back to the store and lets the store clerk have it. Not surprisingly, the guy doesn't let up, which prompts Frank to. You know. Let me tell you something, you goddamn son of a bitch. Now, Frank. Now, Frank. Now, Frank. Nothing. I am gonna speak. You think you can put on a pair of slacks and talk to a grown man like that? Well, do you? This is not how business is done. I am a customer of this store of long standing. I bought a radio back here when there was no TV, and you, sir, were still in your dad's balls. Now, I have been wrong to this transaction. Get off of me. I have been wrong to this transaction, and I have 14 people. An entire cul-de-sac. Coming to my home tonight to watch the fight on my color television. So you need to rectify this situation. Now what do you plan on doing about it? Tell you what I can do. I'll hold the door open for you. So you can carry it back to the car. Maybe you should have gotten the warranty. <laughs> So after that embarrassing mess, Frank finally puts two and two together and realizes who the real culprits are. He grills the kids, minus Maureen since, you know, youngest child status. And after some back and forth between the four, the tension slowly rises in the room until... Dad? I did it! I broke your new TV! You did? Yeah! It was me! Aha! I knew it! How? I poured water down it. P -p poured water? Why the hell would you pour water down it? I'll tell you why, cause you got no respect, that's why! Oh yeah? Well guess what, genius? I didn't do it! You, you didn't? Then why the hell would you tell me you did? Because I fucking hate you! <gasps> yeah, a lot to take in, I know. The first couple of episodes had moments like this that sort of drop you into the middle of the family dysfunction without warning. In just 20 minutes, we've established that Frank's constant tangents and short temper are unavoidable and becoming the norm, Kevin's the lightning rod for ridicule and being blamed for things, and the two main pairs don't seem very amicable to each other under pressure. In the pilot especially, these little outbursts of family drama seem out of place for a comedy show like this, but I think giving them early was a very wise choice. It gives the writers room to slowly but surely amp up the levels of how far you're willing to watch the family dynamic struggle to maintain itself under its own weight. After seeing his dad cry, it was from mosquito fumes, real men from the 70s don't cry. Bill admits that he broke the TV and they drive back to the store so he can apologize. So I kicked the guy's ass, jumped into my car, and I got to the Civic right as Grand Funk was taking the stage. It was insane. It's just another page out of my life journey. Did a bum shit in your mouth? This is what years of pickup artist classes get you, ladies and gentlemen. Bill tries to tell the store clerk about the TV, but you saw how he was talking to Frank. It goes about as well as you'd expect. I mean, as we all saw, he was too busy spitting game at that fine lady over there anyway. I mean, absolutely just killing it. 
Did I tell you how the army didn't take me because they said my dick was too big? I mean, I can't help it. I can't help what I got. I'm not complaining about it, but really wanted to fight for our country. Bill walks away defeated, but before he can exit the store, a scene from Colt Luger plays, which motivates him to take action. He uses his magnet to break every TV in the place, making the manager do a total recall on all the TVs, thinking he got a bad batch from overseas. One racist joke later, and the episode ends with Frank and company enjoying his party. Also, Frank's boss dies off screen, but it's not really important to know. Doesn't even worry about it. Doesn't matter. Overall, a pretty great first episode that introduces some key plot features you'll end up seeing for the rest of the season. The second episode isn't as greatly structured as the first. It takes a lot of weird jumps in its storytelling. So in order for me to explain it and have it make sense, I'll split the three plots up and talk about them individually. Plot A is about how Kevin takes his father's airport job for granted and refers to him as just a baggage handler. Frank ends up taking Kevin, the angsty teenager who doesn't listen, to work with him to show how much he does for the family. I wonder how that's gonna go. The less important B plot has Bill watching over Maureen for the day, trying to keep her out of harm's way. And the C plot is Sue having a mental breakdown. Now at their core, you can tell which one of the stories have more thought put into it than the others. But awful pacing ruins even the best functioning story in the episode. Before I get too hung up on details, let's just go over the plots from least important to most important. Sue's subplot is basically, my life has no purpose outside of being a mother and packaging these dumb kitchen bowls. It's pretty lame, it tries to give us exposition through the lens of Sue talking to the dog of all things, which is a level of down bad, I don't think she reaches after this. It's a pretty useless gap of time that could have easily been cut to make room for the other two plots. Bill and Maureen's side plot has Bill in charge of his little sister, watching him fail to keep her safe. Their plot is pretty uneventful too, I mean the funniest part about it was seeing this scene, which perfectly showcases how clunky the first season's animation was. I can't hear you. Hey bro, watch your jet. Watch your jet bro, watch your jet! But otherwise, it ends up being pretty inconsequential. The A-plot sets up Frank and Kevin's rocky relationship, as well as the conflict of Frank not being able to play both sides at work. See, since his manager died, something that was hilariously recorded and broadcasted in the episode, which I don't think I can show due to how graphic it was, it means that Frank's not just a common bottom of the barrel worker, he's part of higher management. So he's forced to be the new mediator between his old crewmates and his new higher bosses. One of them we'll talk about more in the next episode, but the first one we get to meet is Chief of Ground Services, Bob Pogo. Now, as you can see, he is fat. And that is the extent of his character. His introduction is two and a half minutes of exposition of fat jokes. And while the exposition does feel natural since he's giving new info to both Frank and the audience, literally it feels like they cram every fat stereotype they can for Bob's first scene to wear themselves out from doing it again. They make him a lot funnier in later seasons, but for now, he's just the angry boss guy. And it's also the 70s, so he's probably racist too. The plot consists of Kevin goofing off at the airport, casting out his dad's words about getting his grades together until he sees the aforementioned clip of their manager's head being sliced off. I use head and shoulders. Oops, out your shoulders. Then he sort of helps out his dad on a job in his own weird teen way, which gives the two a bit of a bonding moment in the car ride home, even if Kevin does squander it a bit. <laughs> It's not super well paced, like I said, two poorly handled subplots, but overall it's a pretty good story. It sets up the airline conflict and gives our lovable father and son duo a bit of connection before it's quickly destroyed in the next episode. The third episode further expands on the inner family dysfunction and the airline disputes in a much better way than the second, though it's still not one of the best. The shifting between stories is a lot less clunky and they do a fair job of establishing conflict, but overall there's still a lot of gaps that they fail to fill. The plot still mainly focuses on Frank and his son, this time switching Kevin up for Bill since he didn't do any of the homework that he promised to do in the previous episode. Meanwhile, Kevin gets blazed with his friends instead of learning about history, which I really think is doing him a disservice. He's such a jerk. He's a bigger Hitler than Mr. Hitler's brother Hitler. Wait, who? And the Murphy girls go out to the mall and get stopped by one of Sue's friends. Can you point me to the bargain basement? I'm recently separated. I don't think he ever loved me. Oh god, not her. We'll get to her later, trust me. Kevin's plot, despite being pretty basic, I found to be my favorite. Frank tells Kevin to do his history homework, Kevin being the way that he is, smokes with his friends instead, ends up having a trippy experience involving a piece of his childhood and once again states that he wants to get his act together. It's pretty similar to the previous Kevin plot, but I'm willing to give this one a pass due to a beautifully animated, almost old Cartoon Network-esque scene. When Kevin gets high and stares at an old family album, a cartoonish style Murphy family, pre-Bill and Maureen, look happy, functional. Frank even tells young Kevin that even if they don't get along, he'll still end up loving him. It's a heartwarming scene that I think does a way better job at shifting Kevin's viewpoint than just him seeing his dad get yelled at and feeling bad. He's high and confused, which would make sense for his emotions to be a little more rampant than usual. 
Meanwhile, Sue's plot once again is the weakest. It's honestly filler surrounded by one piece of relevant exposition. She runs into Jenny Throder, one of the most hilariously annoying characters in the entire show. The best way I can describe her presence on the show is completely unnecessary, but her pain is my enjoyment. They end up talking for hours and hours about Jenny's possibly hinted at, not at all very obviously gay husband. It all leads to Sue making an outburst about how sucky her life is. You can't understand how I feel with your perfect life and your beautiful kids. My life isn't perfect, okay? Outside of being a wife and a mother, I've got nothing. I sell plastic that I cry into. We've all got our shit to carry, Jenny. Sometimes I wish I never got married. <gasps> Do you ever stop thinking of yourself? <laughs> Classic. Now, to be fair, they've been talking or rather Jenny's been saying words in the air that Sue happens to hear for a long time so understandably she would want to snap but it still feels like the writers are just spoon feeding you Sue's character rather than letting the progression happen naturally. And finally we have the Frank and Bill plot which sees Frank sucking up to both his oppressive and borderline insane CEO Roger Dunbarton and his fellow low-level union buddy Rosie. All the while, Bill gets pushed to the side and ignored for the entire outing. He can't even get his dad to take him to the bathroom during the baseball game they go to, something he probably wished for as he walked in there and lost his innocence for life. Once again, there's another scene that I'm almost positive I can't show you, but just think of a dirty stadium bathroom during halftime, then amplify it by about a thousand because Bill's a sheltered 10 year old. It's pretty gross, but it signifies two running themes. That of Bill steadily transforming from a regular kid to a troubled one due to lack of parental attention, and Frank steadily becoming overwhelmed with other things in his family life. So in that sense, the scene serves its purpose. The ending of the show is a bittersweet one, though mostly because it feels pretty forced. All three plots merge together as everyone gets back from the house, completely ready to rage out until they hear the music from Kevin's old album. All the tension in the room smooths out. Everyone's mood bounces to mid-tempered. I always liked it too. Why'd you play this now? Want to hear something sucky? It's better than Yelp and Kink bullshit! For about two seconds. So instead of having an happy ending where everybody gets along, they just all awkwardly watch TV. And once again, something at the end happens with Frank being racist on the news, but it makes so little sense in context that it could basically be cut out entirely. They basically make something up so that Rosie has an excuse to tell his union brothers to strike, but earlier scenes already showed that Rosie was beginning to diminish his trust in Frank anyway. Another Ant episode, just barely edging out the last one. The season starts to pick up with one of the funniest episodes so far, F is for Halloween. Hey, fun fact, I actually drafted the script for this video on Halloween. The original idea came out right after my pocket tail video. I didn't take notes until late August and I didn't actually put it together until January, so... Just a timeline of how long it takes me to make these dumbass videos. Anyway, this episode further drives in Frank's inability to think about anything but himself and tend to get higher at Mohican Airways. Sue becomes the top liaison for Plasterware, you know, the people who make the bowls that she cries into, and earns an answering machine, overshadowing Frank, impressing her kids, and dominating in the land around her. Okay, I made that last part up, but you gotta understand how it feels to Frank's low-key misogyny adult mind. Then agree with me. That way we both decided together. They don't have time to talk about Sue's opportunity to get a real job, however, due to the workers at the airline staging a slowdown. And to think I once gave you one of my old suits. And I appreciated that. I used it to upholster my couch and two chairs. And with the leftover material, I made a cover for my pool. I can't lie, even though all they make is fat jokes, they get pretty good ones in sometimes. Back at the house, Sue has to go out on a business run and leaves Frank with the kids for 30 minutes. Just 30 minutes. In that 30 minutes of time, he ignores Kevin trying to actually do his homework for once, makes a syrupy mess in the kitchen, leaves the living room trash, and rejects Sue's plasterware job behind her back. Real smooth guy. I know. Ah, oh Christ, who put syrup on the phone? Due to a mishap at work, he ends up playing his conversation with Sue's boss on the answering machine that Sue overhears. Understandably, she walks out on him without a word. I mean, Frank's honestly lucky she didn't go Street Fighter bonus stage on his car or something. While he's trying to figure out how to get her back or what he'll do with the kids, he's stuck right in the middle of Halloween. This one scene of him going back and forth with Maureen while he tries to feed the kids and the trick-or-treaters is honestly one of the best exchanges in the entire season. Tonight on Colt Luger, the mystery of the missing mother. No, 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 no. Colt Luger is a man. You are a girl. Take that off. Cocksucker! What? When did you hear that? Oh, right. Hey, when your mother comes home, don't tell her I use that word. What if she never comes home? Die, you little cocksucker! Your brother made me say that! With all the stress of being a stay-at-home mom, Frank goes out and tries to find his angry wife. Meanwhile, Bill gets beat up by something by the schoolyard Billy for trying to trick-or-treat or something, I don't know. It's important to know for later that Jimmy wants to beat up Bill, but I think this clip of kids jumping him and calling him a pickle pussy does all the explanation for me. Pickle pussy! Pickle pussy! 
pussy. Thick Help. pussy. Oh. Frank and Maureen finally find Sue. He confronts her and apologizes. Sue begrudgingly accepts it, but also lets Frank know that she's not going to be pushed around and actually got the job. He half-heartedly accepts and everything goes back to normal. Except it doesn't. And that's the thing I like about this show. Because it's episodic instead of always returning to the status quo like other adult shows, it means that internal conflicts like this don't just end with the end of the episode. It would be hella weird if Frank tried to sabotage his wife's one chance to get a paying job, to be an individual, and the two just never brought it up ever again. The show actually gets to divulge into that marital drama as the two get increasingly more and more stressed by their respective struggles. And boy does the Frank and Sue dispute come to a season high with the next episode. Bill Murphy's Day Off, or the alternative title, Bill sees and hears a lot he should not have heard or seen, and also gets his ass kicked. Now there's going to be a hell of a lot of things to discuss with this episode, so once again we're going to split it into sections. The two main plots kind of melt back into each other in the end in an awful way before they split again, so let's complain. Bill and Maureen's plots start with Bill sucker punching the shit out of Jimmy. It goes about as well as you would expect until Maureen jumps in to save him, but if you're an elementary schooler, you basically just let the whole school know that you're a loser. He ends up getting suspended from school but Kevin, his very responsible older brother, just forges Frank's signature and tells him to take a free day. The rest of his scenes are just him messing around trying to fill his time for what would be a regular day. He almost gets caught by Frank and Sue when, oh you just have to wait till we see what happens, we gotta move on. Frank and Sue's plot is the base of the episode, it's also the source of my most recent nightmares. The estranged couple are both stressed by their respective jobs. Negotiations with the union are going awful and just to put it into perspective for you, it starts with Rosie telling Bob and Frank that they will stand by the reason for a raise and ends with a sex bear robot getting shot by a guy with a revolver using a pizza box as a muffler. It's not looking good. Meanwhile, on Sue's end, her boss, who I'm just now realizing is kind of like the green dude from Cat in the Hat, I wonder if that's where they got the idea, Fire! is running her across town with no regard for her personal life. In the middle of this, Kevin gets a C in history, which surprised even me. Sue decides to spring the idea of Kevin getting tickets to his favorite band, Shire Frodo, as a gift before realizing that they're sold out. And her idea of the solution is to ask Frank's union brothers for help. What a pleb. Frank ends up having to ask Vic for tickets, giving one of the other funny scenes of the first season. It's just so comical seeing Vic explain how perfect his life is, thinking Frank can relate in the slightest. Okay, the station's promoting the show, so I know their tickets are here somewhere. Tickets, tickets. Don't you hate it when things get lost in your money drawer? Looks like I need to buy another boat. You know what I'm saying, Frank? Frank gets the tickets for Sue, but by this point, he's already far off the deep end. They get into a heated screaming match that lasts quite a while. Honestly, living in households where this kind of thing was the daily norm made this scene too surreal for me, even on rewatches. Keep in mind, Bill's here while all this is going on, sitting under the bed. And just when you think it can't get any worse. You are a horrible, rotten human being. And you're losing your hair. Okay, okay, okay. Relax, I, I, I pushed you too far. Sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, just, just sit down. Come on, sit down. Mm. Oh, do that again. I hate you. Susan. Yeah? Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, come on, get that off. You can take my slacks off? Yeah, come on. I'll leave the one on. I only need one on. Yeah? Yeah, I like that. Oh, Frank. Oh. oh, yeah, touch it. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh here we go, baby. Frank! Yeah. Frank! Yeah. Frank. Yeah. I had to show you guys that just so you could feel how uncomfortable it was to watch. And if it was uncomfortable for me and you to watch as the audience, you can only imagine how it felt for a 10 year old to hear his parents not only talk shit about him, but see them doing that. Somehow that resolves their conflict and they take Kevin and friends to the concert. To no one's surprise, Shire or Frodo was only sold out because it was the opener for a band people actually wanted to hear. It makes Kevin angry, but it gives his friends an awakening about the type of music they want to make when they see how the ladies react to it. But the band conflict won't really come into play until next season. What's important is that Bill is shattered right now. I wonder if all that emotional trauma will be set off with just a couple of words. Do what I say, you pussy. I am not a pussy! I hate you! I hate this whole family! <laughs> Shut up! 
Yeah, that'll do it. He goes to fight Jimmy again, trying to use a firecracker to coax him out. Where the hell are they getting all these damn firecrackers from? It's all set to the tone of the rock band playing the prestigious hit Lick My Pickle, which sounds funny out of context, but it's a hell of an energetic closer to the episode. He drops the firework when it scorches his hand and it ends up blowing up Jimmy's shed and a chunk of the forest. The sad thing is, at this point, the original family trio was finally starting to appreciate each other in the car ride home. But nope, we're right back to square one. They tease the idea of having normal family ties so much, it's almost saddening to see it just barely not work out. This episode overall was pretty decent despite how chaotic it was, but goddamn. Let's just move on to the final episode before I get a positive headache. Ah yes, the patented Christmas episode. This one has the best cold open in the entire season, but because we are way overdue on time, I can't talk about how funny it is. Watch the show after this video, you won't be disappointed. Anyway, blah blah blah, Billy just set half the neighborhood on fire, the dog ran away, the union is still trying to find a compromise, but Christmas is still right around the corner. Tensions are running at an all time high for the Murphy family, hopefully nothing crazy comes up and ruins it. We'll see. Hey, make yourself useful. Go light your brother's cape on fire. While Sue gets ready for an awfully timed Christmas party, Frank goes to finally settle things between the Union and Corporate. All the kids have their little struggles as well. Kevin goes to sell trees, Maureen goes looking for Major, and Bill gets stuck as an altar boy with, Oh my god, is that the bully? Getting back to the important bits, Dunbarton finally settles an agreement with the Union so that everybody's happy and nobody's job will get cut. It honestly made me smile. Frank's life has been so much hell since this season started, so seeing him finally get a W just fills me with joy. Can I get a pen too? Oh. No, it's just for those two. There's only two pens. What are you saying? Brandy isn't good enough to have a pen? No, she's great. It's just that she's not a signatory of this legal document. So she's a common whore, is that right? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. You think she's just my fuck doll? Everybody thinks that, but I don't. What the hell is going on? Yes, come on. Let's just focus on signing the deal. There is no deal. Then we are calling this strike right now. Now, go ahead. I wouldn't shake the hand of any man who disrespects my wife. I thought that was your daughter. You think I'd fuck something as old as my daughter? I will oh, drown no, 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 you. No, 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 no. Yeah, you didn't think it'd get that easy, did you? I still don't understand the CEO's character. I mean, they kind of set up his weird obsession with his wife's validation, but it feels so out of left field. I'm not against the idea that the season-wide conflict could be held for just a couple more minutes so they could end the episode with that, but this conflict just feels so forced. There's no time to contemplate that though, because the battle's far from over. While Frank tries to mourn the situation and sing an off-key version of Oh Holy Night, Vic does typical Vic things by letting a midget have sex on his car. I wish I could go more in detail about it, but I just need to finish this video. And it doesn't get much better. Everyone else comes in the house to give their awful news all at once. Kevin sold trees about as well as you'd expect, and he ended up breaking someone's windshield. Ah, shit. Major still lost and nowhere to be found. And Bill gets chased home by Jimmy and his father, who's outside asking for a fight. And Frank went to Korea, so you know there's no way in hell he's about to turn down the chance to whoop some ass. It's a bit wobbly animated, which I'm sure is no surprise to you all at this point, but it's an action pack scene that peaks with Sue pulling out a bat and giving that school janitor the business. Whoa! Jesus, so get the fuck off my lawn! Well said. And the conflicts slowly start to fade away. The kids help finish decorating the house, the old neighbor finds their dog, and Kevin... Well, Kevin doesn't really have a solution to breaking that guy's window, so rip. The only thing left to do is fix the union dispute. So Frank ditches his family post, drive down to the airport, and iron things out once and for all. He gives a surprisingly heartwarming speech about how Mohican is a family, how they need to stick together. And after much deliberation, Dumbarton says he thinks he can find a way to sign the deal and still be happy. He signs the paper and the crowd erupts with cheers, shouting Frank's name. It feels like a dream, too good to be true. And then they pull the rug from under Frank once again by letting him know that he's fired for disrespecting him. This sudden flip makes more sense than the last one. I like how he words it, so you think Frank might get off easy, but damn does it hurt to see. It doesn't help that Bob Pogo is the one delivering these words, the man above Frank who couldn't do what he or the previous chief of ground services could do. This is something Frank points out as he goes off on Bob, and rightfully so. He takes his keys and locks them in the car, but the damage is already done. He drives back home, but he can't bring himself to tell his wife and kids the news. I mean, they just saw him end the conflict and save his job. Why ruin it now and let them know that he's unemployed? Frank turns back to his car, only to see Vic outside in the cold, clipping bushes because of course he is. Despite being high out of his mind, Vic still has enough life in him to give Frank some words of encouragement. You'll be okay. You guys are solid. How would you know that? I see you over there, cooking out, tossing the ball with the boys. It's beautiful. You guys are like a Norman Rockwell painting. You want a bump of Ruski? Frank offers Vic a stay at the party, which sort of puts a cap on their one-sided rivalry for a bit, but Vic's Vic. So obviously he's gotta go chase a reindeer in his boxers. 
almost to the end guys. Frank walks back to his house saying he can do it but ultimately understands he can't. Still he walks in the house with a smile and ends off the season on a bittersweet note. Overall, I thought the first season was pretty solid. I think they relied way too heavily on crude humor with the sex scenes, occasional dicks, and vulgar imagery which is definitely uncomfortable to watch. And the second and third episodes feel particularly slow and repetitive, especially with the suicide stories. But underneath all the flaws and once you get around to episodes 5 and 6, the season was pretty okay. A lot of great jokes they don't beat you over the head with and they do a bit to distance themselves from making the show just seem like the typical family sitcom. It has surprisingly dark tones at times which I think it helps the show dip its toes and expose the viewer to much darker shit that will come up in the later seasons. If I had to rate it I'd probably give it a 6.5 to 7 out of 10 and it only goes up from there. But I'll save the rest for when we talk about the next season which uses more episodes to talk about the family dynamics reaction and not only Frank losing his job but Sue stepping up as the head of the household. But I haven't even started writing the script for that so please don't get your hopes up you gremlins. Just kidding guys, thank you for 3k subs, I love you. See you in a month or two, take care everybody. Oh hey, didn't see you there. Um, thank you for watching this video. Uh, it took a very long time as I'm sure I've said a million times, but I had good reasons. Um, one of many being, um, while I was editing this video, did you see what's not actually there on this? You can't see that anyway, but as I was editing the video, um, I realized that this computer only had 8 gigs and the minimum for Adobe is actually 16. So basically, uh, for the past three videos, I've been trying to edit big scale videos on a computer that couldn't handle it, which is basically the equivalent of trying to brush your teeth with your fingers. Like, you can do it, but like, you really shouldn't do that if you don't have to. So I had to upgrade that. Now I can do this. And hopefully there weren't any green spots in this video. I didn't want to mention it um, in the beginning because I didn't, I wasn't sure if it was going to happen again. But hopefully I rendered the whole thing. Don't see any green spots, so it might be good. Uh, also, I got a job so I could actually afford that because the chip for that was like like 200 something. So went through all that. Um, I also, as you can see, kind of got obsessed with buying these little, these little, you know, vinyls. I think they were cool. Uh, if you notice something, let me know, because I might, I've been kind of thinking about doing music stuff on the side, not really on this channel, because it's sort of, you know, like animation and cartoons, but thinking about doing that. Um, but yeah, that, that is stuff about that is going to be coming very soon, just so you know. But um, back to the videos, hope you guys enjoyed. Um, if you guys have any suggestions for me, let me know. I know the skit in the beginning felt like I was kind of, you know, not appreciative, but I really do appreciate when you guys leave comments like that, letting me know. If you liked it or not, you know, what you liked about it. Um, you know, the type of videos you guys want me to make. I made this one, I feel pretty good about it. Not only because um, it was something I wanted to do. You know, I came up with this idea myself. The total drama stuff, I mean, I, I, I still kind of, you know, it's something I wanted to do, but more so because I felt like it was an easy kind of topic. This video took a lot more planning and sort of, you know, relying on what I felt about it than the other videos did. So I'm really proud of that. Um, yeah, that's really all I have to say. And um, I also have to thank you guys um, for, I think, at the time of filming this video, almost 4,000 subscribers. So it's honestly kind of funny because at the beginning I was like, oh, I miss all these milestones because I haven't uploaded for like six months, I think. But the numbers are still growing. It's honestly kind of hard to believe because I didn't, it's kind of hard for me to watch even this, like just, being able to hear myself and play myself back, you know, watching my own stuff. It gets easier over the years, but I'm still kind of, not embarrassed, but I don't know. It's just, it's hard to have pride in what I do sometimes because of just, you know, a lot of stuff going on. But this video I'm really proud of, so hopefully you guys do enjoy it. That's enough out of me though, because hopefully people actually gonna watch this video. I'm not sure how long it's gonna be yet. I just put all the clips together. I'm about to like actually, you know, do some last minute cuts and then toss some music and stuff over and see how long it is. This is probably not making it any better because I didn't write a script for this end part. I just want, I never do, but it's definitely making this video longer. So I'm gonna end off here. Uh, let me guys, let me know what you guys wanna see in the future. Hope you enjoy it one last time. Thank you for your support and I'll see you guys in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day.